அருணாச்சல பதிகம் கருணையாரில்லை அண்டனியனக்கும் காட்டிதம் பருளிலை என்றார் இருளனி உலகில் எங்கே வதைத்து உடல் விடில் எங்கதி என்றார் கருணனை Um, in this video and in the next um, uh, follow this and the following 18 videos we're going to um, be discussing the, um, <coughs> the meaning of uh, two of Bhagavan's works, Arunachala Patikam, which is 11 verses, and Arunachala Ashtakam, which is uh, 8 verses, making a total of 19 verses. And these two works, among all of Bhagavan's works, are unique in that they are the only two works that Bhagavan um, uh, composed without any external prompting. As a general rule, Bhagavan's nature is such that he doesn't give um, any teachings unless asked. He didn't of his own accord try to teach anyone anything. Only because people asked, he answered questions. And um, for example, the, the first person who got really um, significant teachings from him was Shiva Prakashan Pillai, who, uh, who um, came to him and asked, Swami, who am I? And um, then the teachings, of, uh, the answers that Bhagavan gave him, in those days Bhagavan wasn't talking very much, that was in 1901 or 1902. Bhagavan would write either in the sand or on a uh, paper or on slate. Shri Prakash and Pillai kept all of the record of all of those in notebooks and that later became work Nana. So that was the first significant uh, work of Bhagavan's. Um, Shubhakar and Play recorded it only after many years was it um, published um, first in the form of questions and answers and later Bhagavan it was I think first published in 1923 and a few years later Bhagavan made it into a, an essay. Um, other important works like Uludu Napadu Pradeshundia they were written only at the prompting of Murugana. Um, so like that, he, all the translated works, Viva Kuchida Mani, Atma Bodham, um, uh, David Karlot from Atma Sakshat Karaprakanam, um, De Dakshinamurti Stotram, all of those works, uh, Bhagavad Gita Saram, all of those works that Bhagavan translated from Sanskrit, they were all done uh, 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 in some context on the, uh, uh, the request of someone. Um, but um, these two hymns are the only two that Bhagavan wrote without any, um, any prompting. The other work that comes closest to this was Aksharam Mulai. Um, there was some external prompting. The reason Bhagavan composed Aksharam Mulai was um, in, in those, that, that was around 1912, I think, that Bhagavan composed that. In those days, um, before Bhagavan's mother came and settled um, in Virupakshi, they, were, they didn't do any cooking. They, um, in early days, Bhagavan himself used to go begging food. Later on, other devotees would go, and um, the people in the town would usually uh, recognize the, um, the group of Bhagavan's devotees. So they were, everyone was eager to feed, because Bhagavan already had a high reputation among local people. Um, they, they were eager to give food because they knew it would go to Bhagavan. But some other groups of sadhus uh, found that if they could um, go singing the same songs that Bhagavan's uh, group of uh, devotees would sing, people would mistake them to be Bhagavan's devotees and they would get the food that was intended for Bhagavan. So, um, knowing that this was happening, some of the devotees of Bhagavan, sadhu, sadhu devotees, asked Bhagavan to compose a song specially for, for them, so that they could go singing it while begging. 
And Bowman said, no, there's Tilavaska and there's Deva and what you're already singing, that's been sung by great uh, saints, Why? what's the need for me to sing anything? But they kept on pressing him and um, one day he, uh, when he went round the hill, um, the devotee who accompanied him took pen and took a pencil and paper just in case Bhagavan may start to compose verses and on the way Bhagavan spontaneously started to compose verses and during the eight mile walk um, Bhagavan will often sit and uh, sit just looking at Arunachala so whereas it's easy to walk the whole way around uh, Arunachala in about three hours or even less if you're in a hurry um, Bowen usually would often take a full day or even sometimes two, two or three days, he would go so leisurely. So anyway, the devotee who accompanied Bhagavan on that day and, um, had brought uh, paper and uh, pencil or pen and um, Bhagavan started to compose Akshramlai and the first, very first word of Akshramlai was Arunachala, the name that was so dear to his heart, the name that had been echoing in his in his mind since his very early childhood even before he knew that Arunachala was a place on earth and a hill on earth um, so he he um, he began with the first verse Arunachala mena ahamei nene pava ahate vera rupai Arunachala oh Arunachala you uh, root out the ego you eradicate the ego of those who think of you and then the first words can be interpreted in several different ways who, those who think that uh, Arunachal alone is I those who uh, think of you um, think of you within the heart as Arunachala it gives various meanings but anyway but that first verse begins with the word Arunachala and deals with the central topic of Bhagavan all Bhagavan teachings which are about Ahate Rarupai, eradicating the I, the ego. So, um, and then during the course of that production, Bhagavan composed all 108 verses. That was in um, 1912. So that was, though it was, there was some prompting from devotees because they wanted a song for a particular purpose. Bhagavan was constantly declining, but then that day suddenly it, uh, the, the verses started coming to him spontaneously. So actually we can say it's a semi-spontaneous um, uh, composition. But these two uh, works, Arunachya Patikam and Arunachya Ashtakam, these are an entirely spontaneous work. One day, um, in about, I think it was about 1916 or so, the words Karanaya uh, Lenne Andani kept on coming to Bhagavan and he kept on trying to put the words aside and think what have these words got to do with me but the words kept on coming and either that day or the next day he decided the only way to, um, to, um, to get rid of these words is to compose a, a, a verse with those words so he composed the first verse and um, that first verse ends with the word anbe. Anbe means, uh, well, ambu is love. Anbe, he's addressing Arunachala as, oh, love. That Arunachala is the, is the very embodiment of love. So he's addressing Arunachala as love. Um, the next day, um, the uh, words amburu varunachala started coming to him. Amburu varunachala means Arunachala, the form of love. So again, he found the only way to, to um, free his mind from these words was to compose a verse. In this way, for 10 consecutive days, each day, the um, words started coming to his mind, beginning with the last word or the last uh, group of letters of the previous verse. Those, uh, was uh, a, a clause with those words started coming to his mind he would compose a verse and then the next day the next verse so in 10 days he composed 10 verses and um but on the 10th day he, he actually composed uh, two verses 
um, and um, either that same evening or the next day when he was in Skandashram um, he composed the first six verses of Ashtakov um, and um, then uh, that evening um, a devotee came who had already printed Akshramalai <coughs> and when he came to know about these verses he said oh Bhagavan I want to uh, print these verses so Bhagavan looked at them and he noticed the first 11 verses were written in one meter called Erosir Viratam. Viratam is a particular type of, um, it's, it's a word based on the Sanskrit word Vritta. Um, uh, in Tamil it becomes Viratam. It's a particular um, musical style of, uh, of verse. Um, Erosir means seven seer, seven feet. So it's, uh, each line of the verse, it consists of four lines, each line has seven feet. Um, because seven feet makes long, usually when it's printed, it's printed as eight lines. Uh, uh, four, then three, four, three, four, three. But actually, the verse is uh, four lines of uh, seven feet each, uh, each verse. Um, so there were 11 verses in that meter. The other six verses were in what is called uh, what is called um, n veritam. That's an 8 seer veritam. It's a very similar meter, but instead of having um, seven feet a line, it's eight feet a line. So seeing that it was just seven, uh, six verses, Bhagavan then composed two more verses, and he said well, we can take the first 11 as uh, patikam, and the second 11 is Ashtakam. Ashtakam is a Sanskrit word, word that means, uh, Ashta means eight. Ashtakam is a group of eight verses. Um, Patikam is a, is a Tamil word adapted from, uh, in, in, in Sanskrit, 10 verses would be called uh, Dasakam. In, the equivalent of that in Tamil is Patikam. Patu means 10. So Padikam is uh, means a group of ten, um, uh, 10 verses, but usually, for some reason in Tamil literature, the Padikam, instead of being 10 verses, they're always 11 verses. So the 11 verses became Aranatya Padikam, the 8 verses became Aranatya Ashtakam. These two works, as I said, they, these were completely, uh, uh, without any external prompting, uh, Bhagavan composed these. Later when he, um, when people talked about these and said these were the only two that you composed without any prompting, Bhagavan said no, 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 just like you people prompt me from outside to write other things, Arunachala prompted me from within to write this, these two works. Um, so Bhagavan disclaimed any doership even in uh, writing these two works. But they are very, very special because they are, um, we can say, since it was without any external prompting, these, um, these uh, um, show Bhagavan's teaching in a very pure and undiluted form. And these two works are full of bhakti and jnana. Patikam is more bhakti, but a lot of the bhakti is, um, is um, often when Bhagavan composes verses, he, in the language of uh, devotion, he metaphorically is talking about jnana. So Patikam is full of bhakti, but also some jnana here and there. Ashtakam, as it goes on, becomes more and more about uh, uh, jnana. Um, so much so that in the seventh verse of uh, Aranach Ashtakam, he begins by saying, um, um, uh, <coughs> Indra hameno nine veni piravondrum. If, if the thought called I is not, nothing else is. This is the same teaching that he gave in verse 26 of Uludunapadu. Uh, if the ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. Uh, if ego is not, everything is not. Uh, ego itself is everything, or ego alone is everything. So, 
he, the, what Boban wrote in all of the in 1928, he had eight, uh, 12 years earlier, he had written that same basic fundamental teaching of his in Naranach Ashtakov. It, only when the ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. Without the ego, there is nothing else. Nothing else means no other pheno no phenomena exist. Phenomena, everything perceived exists only in the view of the perceiver. All objects appear only in the view of the subject. So only when the subject comes into existence do objects come into existence. Only when the first person rises do second and third persons appear. Without the first person, without the ego, without the subject, the perceiver, there is nothing, no phenomena, nothing perceived, no objects. This is Bhagavan's fundamental teaching. What remains when the ego doesn't rise is what alone is real, what alone is permanent. That is the, um, that is our own real nature, which is what Bhagavan refers to metaphorically in Aranachala Stuchpanchikam, in the five hymns to Aranachala, as Aranachala. Though he addresses Aranachala as a hill, it's, it, by the term Aranachala, he's both referring to the physical form of the hill and metaphorically to our real nature. So we, we can't, uh, we can't say, oh, he's talking only metaphorically about our real nature. We can't say he's talking only about the physical form of the hill. He, the, 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 um, the metaphor and um, the, um, and it's both, it can be taken both literally and metaphorically. Both, both meanings are equally valid and both meanings are equally uh, true. So that's um, an introduction to how Bowen came to compose these. So this time I will talk about the meaning of uh, verse 1 of our natural uh, patikam, the very first verse that he, in this group of 19 verses, the first verse that he composed. Um, as I say, the, this work came to him, um, the, the words that initially came to him were karane a le ne and ni. Karane is a it's a Tamil form of a Sanskrit word, karana, which means grace. Karanayal means by grace. Karanayal enai andani. Karanayal means by grace. Um, enai means me. Anda is a, um, is a relative participle of the verb al which means to receive or accept, like a protege, to take possession of, to rule, to reign over, to govern, to control, to manage, maintain or to cherish. So, um, and, so and means who, who, who took possession of me. Um, ni, ni means you. So karane ale ni, and ni means you who took possession of me, who ruled over me, who cherished me, took me as your own, um, by your kar karaneya, by your grace. There's so much love in these opening words of this verse. It, Bhagavan is expressing here his love for Arunachala and the love that Arunachala had for him. Uh, this w verb al, which in the relative participle, become, in past relative participle, comes under, um, it, it is a, a word used so much in Tamil devotional literature. It's the Lord, the God, taking possession of us, taking, taking us as His own. So, when we aspire to surrender to. Um, to Bhagavan, to Arunachala, to God, whatever we call the Guru, whatever we call it, um, when we aspire to surrender ourselves, we want to be taken possession of. So it is, we can say, it's the other side of surrender. That we try to surrender ourselves, he takes possession of us. So <clears throat> these, are the op these are the opening words, Karaneal and Ne and Ni. But this is not a complete sentence, it's just a um, uh, 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 personal pronoun you and a relative clause. So the, the rest, um, 
this verse actually it, com it consists of three sentences in all so I'll go through sentence by sentence the first clause of the first sentence is Karaneale ne andani in a kun kakshidan tarale in drow that is when it's split it into words is Karaneale in ne andani in a ku un kakshi tandu arolile in drow so um, he, he um, uh, Endral means if. Um, it, it makes the whole clause into a conditional clause. So, if you, who took possession of me by your grace, um, <coughs> if you are uh, 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 means to be. Arul is a, a, um, both a noun and a verb in Tamil. As a noun, it means grace, um, um, uh, grace, mercy, uh, favor, benevolence, kindness. Uh, it means much the same as karuna in uh, karuna in Sanskrit, um, or kripa. Kripa is another term that means grace. Um, but Arul is also a verb, and here he's using it as a verb, which means to be gracious, kind, compassionate, or to favor, to grant, to bestow, or to speak graciously. It depends on the context in which it's used. So, um, if you who took me as your own are not gracious, giving me sight of you, um, uh, giving me sight of you, uh, that is, um, unkakshi, uh, tandu means giving literally it means giving your sight or giving your vision um, kakshi means um, it means what is seen a sight uh, um, um, a view vision perception knowledge so kakshi also means knowledge here so it means if you do not give me sight of you or if you do not give me knowledge of you um, uh, that's the conditional clause. Um, then the, the main clause is, um, well, the, yes, the main clause is right at the end of this sentence. Um, Engati en nam means uh, what will be my gati. Gati means my state or condition. Gati is a Sanskrit word. It has many. Um, it has many. Uh, it has a a range of meanings it can mean gati means going so it can mean a path uh, or a, a means a path it also means arriving so gati also means refuge or salvation or goal or a state or condition in this context it means a state or condition so in gati enam means what will be my state or in other words, what will become of me? So if you do not give me your vision, what will become of me? But he adds in more there. Before, before, um, before that, he adds in another. Within the main clause, there's a, another conditional clause. Ibudul um, vidil means if I give up this body. So if I leave this body. And uh, then before that comes uh, um, an adverbial clause. Irul um, nali um, hill engie padetu. Irul means darkness, but it often it also is often used to mean um, uh, mental darkness. That's uh, delusion, ignorance. Um, spiritual ignorance and also um, um, moral corruption or suffering. There's no, all those meanings are covered by, uh, are included in Iru. Um, Nali means uh, misery, suffering or distress. Uluhu is world. So he's describing the world as it's a world of darkness and suffering. Darkness, in the sense, it is a—it's a delusion. It's all an illusion. It's not none of it is real. 
It is, uh, it's because of the delusion of experiencing ourselves as I am this body, as this ego, but we see a world. The world is not, has no, does not exist except when we rise as ego in waking and dream. In waking we rise and we see this world, in dream we rise we see some other world. So, um, uh, but, but because the world uh, arises only because of our self-ignorance, and self-ignorance is a darkness, um, obscures the clarity of self-awareness in our heart, so we take all, all this appears real, and because because of the, the, um, the darkness of self-ignorance, we experience ourselves as a finite being, as if we are separated from the infinite whole we actually are. So, since our real nature is happiness, infinite happiness, when we limit ourselves as this person, as this, by identifying ourselves with a body, um, we 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 are dissatisfied because we're no longer experiencing ourselves as the infinite happiness that we actually are. So whatever pleasure or fleeting happiness we may experience as an ego is never satisfactory. So we're always dissatisfied. And because of our dissatisfaction, it gives, it gives rise to desire. And because of desire, um, give rise to selfishness and all other bad qualities. So all, all corruption, all, um, all moral corruption, all corruption of the, uh, all spiritual corruption, begins with this darkness of self-ignorance. But is the very nature of ego. Um, so there's so in in every word Bhagavan uses, there's so much meaning there. And as a result of this self-ignorance, what is the result? Nulli, suffering. And this is the nature of the world. The world is, we think oh, our life is okay. We, we see other people suffering, we may think our life is not so bad. So we, life isn't all suffering, we may think. But what Bhagavan means by suffering is dissatisfaction. None of us are ever satisfied. Whatever pleasures, whatever we get, we may be partially satisfied, but we're still hankering for something more. There's never satisfaction. That hankering is um, what is um, expressed by the next word, engi e. Engi is a, a, a verbal participle of, um, of the verb engu. Engu means to, um, to yearn, long for, pine, languish, weep, wail, cry or sob. So, um, most of us are, are, are pining for, well, we're all, we're all pining for happiness. Whether we're a saint or a sinner, we're all pining for happiness. But uh, most of us are seeking the happiness outside us. So we are pining for whatever we think will give, make us happy, whether it's money or sensual pleasures or intellectual pleasures or whatever whatever type of pleasures it may be we're hankering for them in the case of Bhagavan he's not hankering for any of these things Bhagavan is here taking himself from the, he's, he's singing this from the standpoint of a devotee so as if he's though Arunacha has taken possession of him he's still not surrendered himself completely so he's still hankering for that uh, for, for that grace, for that vision, that unkakshi, your vision, your the, the sight of you, knowledge of you, to see you as you really are. So he's still, he's he's taking the point of a, of he's he's singing this from a, a perspective of a devotee who is very very close to surrendering himself, but hasn't yet surrendered himself fully. So hasn't yet seen. Uh, our nature as he really is, which is our own real nature, Musvarupa. So that's the hankering Bhagavan is, uh, is um, sub that's the hankering that is causing Bhagavan suffering. Whereas we're suffering, hankering for worldly things, he was suffering far more intensely, hankering for our nature. This is the state before he had actually of course, he sang this after he had merged and become one with Arunachala, but he's 
uh, he's singing it as if in mistake before he had reached that point. Um, so uh, that pining, that yearning is expressed by Engie and the next word is again another uh, verb adverbial participle, padetu, uh, which means um, it's, uh, uh, um, it's the uh, adverbial participle of pade, uh, which means um, to suffer intensely, be in agony, shake and tremble with grief, pain or fear. Again, many of these words it's difficult to bring out the full flavour of the word of the Tamil word by any one word of English. So sometimes you have to give a range of meanings just to give an idea. So it's it's that um, that intense suffering is expressed by Padetu. So the meaning of this whole sentence is if you who by your grace took possession of me um, are not gracious to me giving me sight of you or giving, giving me knowledge of you give, enabling me to know you as you actually are to see you as you actually are what will be my state if I leave this body after pining and suffering intensely in this dark and uh, miserable world that is the, the first uh, sentence um, the idea in this sentence in, in the, what is indirectly asking for here he's asking Arunachala to give uh, to bestow upon him his kakshi kakshi it's a Tamil word but it can mean the same as dashana in Sanskrit dashana means what is seen the sight the vision um, but just like dashana is often used metaphorically Bhagavan sometimes talks of uh, Swarupa Dashanam. He talks of self knowledge as Swarupa Dashanam, the seeing of one's own real nature. It's that Swarupa Dashanam, that uh, uh, Atma Kakshi, seeing one's own self, Swarupa Kakshi, is what the Kakshi Bhagavan is talking about here, because our nature is nothing but our own self. So um, he's, he's, pre he's indirectly in the first sentence, he's He's begging Arunachala for that kakshi, for that, uh, for the sight of him, for seeing his real nature, for knowing, for um, being aware of himself as he really is. Um, uh, so in the next sentence he says, um, Arunay, uh, sorry, Ar Arunane Kannadu uh, Alaromol Kamalom. That means uh, Aru, Ar, Aruna, um, one of the meanings of Aruna is sun. Arunachala is the hill of. Uh, Achila means motionless, it also means a hill. So Arunachala is the. Uh, Aruna can mean, um, can mean the sun, it can mean um, redness, like the redness of the setting sun. It has various different meanings. One of the meanings of, of Ar Aruna is a name of Surya, of the sun. So here Bhagavan is using Aruna to refer to the sun. Um, he, he says, um, without seeing the sun, can the lotus blossom? Um, obviously this is metaphorical. He's referring here, what the lotus he's referring to here is the lotus of his own heart his own mind can his mind can his heart blossom with self-knowledge without seeing the sun of self-knowledge which is our natural um, so that that is a um, that's a short sent, a short uh, question he asked there that question the next sentence is not actually a sentence at all it is just that uh, he's addressing Arunachala but it's it's closely connected with this sentence it's the what is uh, what is implied by this sentence is connected with this so uh, it, it's um, it's written very it's written in a very beautiful and very um, it's written in a way but we have to we have to read behind the, the uh, read between the lines read behind the words so in the next sentence what he says is 
as I say, it's not actually a sentence, it's just a, it's a vocative, he's addressing our natural. Um, the, the main verb, the, sorry, the main word of the, uh, of, the, um, of the sentence is the last word, anbei. Anbu means love, it means love, it means uh, uh, affection, um, it can also mean attachment, it can also mean grace, but especially it means love. So he's, Ambe is in this context, A is an intensifier, but it can also be used as a vocative ending. So Ambe means he's addressing Arunachala, oh love. That Arunachala is love itself. Um, so, so everything else is describing that. So actually to, um, uh, to explain the meaning of sentences in Tamil, we often we have to begin from the end and go backwards. Um, um, the whole of the, uh, first I'll read the whole sentence. Arunanuk, Arunanuk, Arunan, Arunana Mani, Arunani Surandu, Angu Aruviyai Peruhum, Aruna Ma Malay Enum Ambe. Um, the first clause in this is an ad adverbial clause. Um, Arunanuk uh, um, Arunan A Mani. As I said, Aru, Arun Aruna is a Sanskrit word. Uh, in Tamil, it's personalized as Arunan. Arunan means uh, the sun uh, as a. Uh, it's a as a per, as taking the sun as a person, personalizing the sun. So, um, Arunanuk, Arunaku means to the sun, Arunan means sun, so sun to the sun. Uh, A means as, money uh, is a, a, a verbial participle of the verb uh, manu, which means to, um, to be permanent, to endure, to um, to stay to remain, so it, it means being. Uh, so it, it means being permanent. Um, so being what is. So he, he's, the implication is that our natural is what is always the um, always the sun to the sun. Arunaluk ku arunan. The sun is the source of light for this world. So, uh, sun is here used as a metaphor for light, and the uh, sun to the sun is the light to the light. All the phenomena we see in the world are illumined by the light of the sun. But what is it that is, but, um, but all, these are, all these are known only by the light that is mind. The mind is the light that in lieu, with, without the mind we wouldn't, uh, without, the, without the awareness that we call mind, we wouldn't uh, be able to uh, see the physical light. So there's the physical light, the light of the sun, there's the mental light, the light of the mind, but what is it that illu what is the light that illumines the mind? That is the light of pure awareness. So the ultimate light, the light for all lights, is the light of pure awareness, the light that is our natural, the light that is our real nature. So that is what why Bhagavan refers to, says here, being permanently the sun to the sun. That means being the light that illumines all lights. Um, but it also, it means the light that illumines all light, but it's also connected with the previous sentence when he says without seeing the sun. So since Aaron, since Aaron actually, just like a lotus cannot blossom without seeing the sun, the lotus of my mind cannot blossom without seeing you, um, Arunachala. The lotus of my heart cannot blossom without seeing you. Blossom there means blossom with self-knowledge. And without seeing you means without seeing that pure self-awareness. But you actually are the pure pregne. Um, but but is but our natural actually is so without seeing that but he's not asking a question here he's he the question is implied in this sentence as a follow-on from the previous sentence 
So being the sun to the sun. So since you are the sun to the sun, just like the lotus cannot blossom, my mind cannot blossom without seeing you. That's all in play. The rest of it is all a description of Ar Aranachala. Um, he, uh, so I'll begin from the end because in order to um, in English a relative clause comes after the noun um, but in Tamil the relative clause will always come before the noun that it refers to so Ambe he refers to Arunachala as O love Aruna ma malay enum Ambe O love called Aruna ma malay ma means great malay means hill Aruna is referring to Arunachala so the group called the Great Arana Hill. Oh, love called the Great Arana Hill. So what, what, when Bhagavan is singing in praise of Aranachala, though he is seemingly sing, singing in praise of, um, of a hill, um, as he refers to it at the beginning of Ashtakam, Ari Varu Giri, as if it's an insentient hill, as if it has no awareness, actually what Bhagavan's sees as Aranachala is nothing but that infinite love, that infinite awareness, the, uh, our real nature. Um, so that he, is, he is that infinite love, but he appears in the form of Aranachala hill. And uh, then he, there's a, that's one relative clause, so it's, O oh love, uh, called the great hill Aran, Arana, or Arana, the great Arana hill and then there's another within that relative clause there's another relative clause Aro Nani Surandu Angu Aruviai Peruhum that means in that hill where um, Aru Peruhum Aro means grace where grace uh, uh, Peruhu Peruhu is a um, per peruhu means um, uh, to increase, to multiply, to spread, to abound, become full, to rise, to surge, to swell, to overflow, to prosper or to grow. So uh, aru peruhu means where, where grace um, surges forth and then he describes how it surges forth Nanni Surandu Angu Aruviai. Um, Angu means where. It's making the. Per, uh, it's making it. Uh, that there is included in the. In English, when we put it, we. we in English, we have. Um, we have. Um, uh, relative pronouns. Which. Uh, what, uh, which. Uh, who. Where. Um, so to make it, but in Tamil there are no relative pronouns, they're, they're what are called relative participles. But to make it clear that the sense of this is not which but where, he, the, angu, he, the word angu comes in there. Um, uh, as I say, uh, nan, nanni, nanni means, um, is an adverb meaning abundantly or well. Uh, um, sur surandu is an adverbial pas participle of the verb sura, which means to spring forth, stream out, um, gush, flow, increase steadily, increase steadily, pour forth continuously, give abundantly. Aruvi is a means a spring or a waterfall or the mouth of a river, where the river comes out, where the river s flows forth from the. Uh, mountain. Um, so um, the, the whole of this clause, um, uh, Aro Nani Surandu Angu Aruviai Peruhum means um, where grace surges forth as a spring, gushing forth abundantly. So he's, ad he's addressing Arunachala as, as love. The love that is called Ar uh, the Great Hill Aranachala, where grace uh, um, surges forth as a spring, gushing forth abundantly. 
that's all that so this sentence the whole well it's an incomplete sentence what it means is being the son to the son O love called the great arena hill where grace surges forth as a spring uh, where grace surges as a uh, a spring gushing forth abundantly that's all that's there it's, it's, it hasn't actually complete but it's the it is implied a link with the previous sentence so it, the implication is just like he said in the previous sentence um, without seeing the sun will a lotus blossom likewise being the sun to the sun O love called the great Arunachala hill where grace surges forth as a torrent uh, the implication is, will my heart uh, blossom without seeing you? The heart is often the heart of a. Uh, um, uh, yes, the heart is often described as a lotus. So, the, before the dawn of self knowledge, the lotus is a. The lotus called heart is a bud. When, when it is exposed to the sunlight of our natural, when, when we turn within and see our real nature, see what we actually are, then the uh, lotus will blossom. That blossoming of the lotus is, uh, um, is, the, is the dawning of self-knowledge. So, um, this, uh, though, this verse is actually all about uh, the path of bhakti and jnana. How we can surrender ourselves completely to our natural. We can only, Bhagavan has made it clear, surrender can be, become complete only when we surrender the ego. And the only way to surrender ego is to, um, is to know what it actually is. Because what is ego? Ego is nothing but a false awareness of what we actually are. We are aware of, now I am aware of myself as I am Michael. This, this mixed awareness, I am Michael, is ego. The pure awareness, I am, the awareness just of my being, uh, that is our natural, that is our real nature. So, um, um, in order to... Uh, the, the ego is nothing but a wrong awareness of ourself. In order to give up that wrong awareness, in order to surrender that wrong awareness, um, we, we need to know what we actually are. Because the ego is a wrong knowledge of ourself, a mistaken awareness of ourself. Only by being aware of ourselves as we actually are, can we free ourselves from the ego, can we surrender the ego. And only when we surrender ego, can we surrender all its desires, its attachments, everything else. We can surrender desires and attachments to some extent without surrendering the ego, but we can never surrender them entirely without surrendering the ego. So our aim is to surrender the ego entirely. In order to surrender ego entirely, how can we do so? Only by seeing our natural, by, see, by seeing the, the, the true form of our natural, not just our natural as a hill, uh, the hill of stone, but the real form of our natural, that which is always shining in us as I. That is the, the kakshi, the, the vision, the darshana that Bhagavan is praying for. That's the rupa darshana, the vision of his own nature. And how can he attain that? We, how can he, how can his, how can the ego, how can the heart blossom and the ego be dissolved in the, uh, in that infinite clarity of pure self-awareness? only by seeing our real nature. So, it, 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 though this is in the form of, of, of it's expressed in the language of bhakti, and it, it's the, the full, so much love is there in, in all of Bhagavan's words, but it's, it's what he, what is it, what is it that he loves, what is it that he's longing for? He's longing to be one with our natural. He's able to be one with our natural only by surrendering himself to our natural. And he's able to surrender himself to our natural only by seeing our natural as it really is. And since our natural is nothing but our own self, it's only by seeing ourselves as we actually are that we can surrender ourselves and become one with our natural. So it's um, in, in this first verse, it's a beautiful blending of bhakti and uh, jnana 
expressed all in, in metaphorical poetic language very very beautifully so the the meaning of the whole verse uh, just to recap again and I in when I read the first, last sentence I will I will include the words which are not actually in the verse but are implied there will my heart blossom without seeing you that is what is implied there so I'll include that because otherwise it's incomplete without that if you who by your grace took possession of me are not gracious giving me sight of you what will be my state if I leave this body after pining and suffering intensely in this dark and miserable world without seeing you the sun will a, sorry no sorry I read that wrongly without seeing the sun will a lotus blossom likewise being the sun to the sun O love called the great Arana hill where grace surges uh, surges as a spring gushing forth abundantly will my heart blossom without seeing you so there's so much so much longing is expressed in these words so much love and longing are expressed in these words and you get Bhagavan is expressing his own love for Arunachala and he's also implying the love, great love that Arunachala has for him since Bhagavan is none other than Arunachala himself he's he's teaching us here he has so much love for us he's taken possession of us he's brought us to his feet now we have to surrender ourselves to him how can we surrender ourselves to him only by seeing him as he actually is and how can we see him as he actually is since he's always shining in our heart as I we have to turn within and see him as he actually is that is the that is the the vision that we should be longing for that Swarupa Darshana that uh, vision of our own real nature uh, see the, the knowledge of our the awareness of our self as we actually are that is what Bhagavan is praying for in this verse and in all the other verses in one way or another um, so in, in the next video we'll take up the, the second verse which begins with the the final word of this verse is the uh, ambe is the first word of the next verse uh, which begins amburu varunachala arunachala the form of love and that way all these 19 verses uh, the last word becomes the first word of the next verse this is what is called antadi but it's not a full antadi a full antadi is a group of a hundred verses in which the final verse ends with the first word of the very first verse it's not it's not a complete circle like that but these 19 verses are connected in that antadi form that makes it easy for remembering the sequence when reciting um, and it's, it's also it's a poetic embellishment um, so we'll deal with the next uh, verse uh, next time which is again all about love and bhakti and jnana that's what Bhagavan's whole Bhagavan is the very embodiment of bhakti and jnana like he says I'm Buru Varunachra Arunachra the form of love Bhagavan is the form of love and that love is as he say, often said bhakti is the mother of jnana without love there can be no jnana it's because of our desire for this world but the desire to be aware of things other than ourselves but we rise as ego in order to surrender this ego we must have all-consuming overwhelming love to see ourselves as we actually are and thereby giving up the ego and awareness of all phenomena Thank you.